All right, recording. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Culture Shock. I am here today. I am your host, Seth McKendry, and I am here today with a fellow woodworker and someone who was the host to one of one of the coolest field trips i've ever been a part of (laughs) and i'm probably never gonna forget that uh this is george ladies and gentlemen hey what's up uh culture shock people hey by (laughs) by the way that's a great name man appreciate it i was mulling over it for a month (laughs) just Ah, trying to find the right name uh i'm surprised it wasn't taken yeah, I'm surprised it wasn't taken either. Uh uh-huh. Cool. Cool, cool. So, uh... Have you talked about woodworking on the podcast before? No, this is the first time, actually, oh. I've talk, talked about woodworking. Do people know you as a woodworker? Uh, believe it or not, no. I mean, oh. I've posted some some stuff here and there on social media about it. But I haven't posted very much because uh, most of the time, you know, you know, when you're in the wood shop, you're not in there to be on your phone. You're in there to get stuff done. Right. So yeah, that'd uh, be the last time. That's why you know I'm not on my phone much and exactly. doing the whole Instagram thing and you know all right. that stuff when right. I'm in the shop because I'm in the shop to get work done and I'm not there to dilly dally okay. you know okay all right hey but you take good pictures next to your finished work i mean you can at least do do that right and i've taken a few pictures of like um, progress shots of uh, yeah. my work yeah because i'm working on a table right now uh, mm-hmm. we did the maloof table uh i already took i was working on that earlier today oh really because uh I was working on like sanding down some parts and like oiling it and everything. Uh Uh And I'm also, I showed you that other table, didn't I? Oh, the other table. Shoot, man. If you did, I apologize, man. My memory (laughs) is uh, scattered and thin. Yeah. I, uh, what table? The coffee table. Coffee table. What was the shape? It was, uh, Dang, let me see if I can pull it up. But um, it was it was a coffee table that had glass in the middle of it. Like I cut a whole piece out in the middle. Glass? It was made out of oak. Okay, I can. Mm. You say glass, and I think I would picture it if I saw it. So chances are. This one right here. Oh, okay, okay, cool, cool, man. Where is that now? It's in the uh, Sanderson Wood Shop. It's in okay. one of the finishing rooms, just getting heated so it can cure. Okay. Okay. Because I put oil on the top and the bottom of the yeah uh, the top part. Yeah, yeah. That takes a long time to dry or to cure. Right. Yeah, it takes. Yeah. Plus, it's in a eighty-five degree room, so mm, it's gonna okay. okay. That, you from what I pitch? heard, that will help out a lot. Yeah. Where's it going to go? It's going to go with me to Arizona. Same with that Where Maloof you... table, uh-huh. except for I'm going to leave that Maloof table back for a little while uh-huh. and then come uh-huh. back for it because I can't bring everything. Okay. What's up with Arizona? Uh, <laughs> what I'm doing is I'm going after I graduate. Uh-huh. I'm going to move to Arizona and then go to Scottsdale Community College for film, film and media production, and also theater, uh, I think it's called theater makeup effects or something like that. I think that's how they classify it. But I'm going to go for two years. Uh Uh-huh. What'd you say? Uh Uh-huh. Two years, Scottsdale Junior College? Uh, college? Yeah, the community college. Okay. Oh, I'm man, that's awesome. For two years. Uh-huh. And then after those two, since I'm going to go to college for four years and get a bachelor's uh-huh. degree in film, well, at least I'm going to try. 
Um, okay. I'm going to go for two years. And then Thank after you. that, I'm going to transfer to Arizona State. Mm-hmm. And then finish out my time in college there. Uh-huh. That's Phoenix, right? Yeah. Okay. Actually, I think it's in Tempe. Tempe? It might be. Because that's, yeah. uh, that's where I'm going to be living. So it's the closest uh-huh. to where I'm going to be. You have family there or friends? Yeah. Or? I, okay. uh, two of my brothers and my sister-in-law live there. Oh, so. man. I'm excited for you. And also, okay. Yeah. Oh, continue? I didn't mean to cut you no, off. You no, know, it makes me think of um, Callius and West. Are you familiar? I look at the two video files, and whichever yeah. video file is like looks better quality wise, yeah, I take that raw audio file and I upload it. I do no editing whatsoever. But then Ooh. I talked to a few people, and they said yeah. that some of the podcasts were yeah. there was a lot of points where there was just dead silence. Uh huh. So they said, what you need to do, you need to trim that down I see. because of those dead silent spots. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you don't want that, that silent part, right? I get it. Hey, um, what do you say? Like this silent part right here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So when do you leave to Arizona? Uh, I'm looking to leave maybe in July. All right. That's coming up quick. Yeah. Because I'm going to yeah. enroll as soon as I can and make yeah. sure to get out there before, like, the school year starts so I can yeah. make sure to get all situated and everything. Yeah. All right. Cool, man. Good luck to you. Um. I, I hope, you know, I make my way out there. I want to remember you and even holler it like, hey, what's up, Seth? It's George. Remember me? Yeah, I'll, I'm going I'll out to sure. visit my I'm going out to visit my cousins in Chandler, Phoenix. You know? Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go see spring training, you know. The Dodgers, because that's one of my things right now. Um, uh, and then I'm gonna look you up. And what I'll make sure to do is uh what I'm going to do after that whole film school thing yeah, is there is a professional wrestling school about an hour away from where I'm going to live. No way. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to learn how to wrestle and also have a couple yeah. of jobs by, yeah. like, by then. So I can have like a, kind of a financial blanket if to say. So I can you're gonna- do like. Yeah. You're going to wrestle professionally? Yeah. Dude, I thought you already know how to wrestle, though. Yeah, I know how to wrestle amateurly, but this is, uh-huh. this is different. Okay. It's, is this uh, WWF style? Yeah. <sighs> I love it. It's like the stuff you see on TV. And yeah. transitioning to yeah. uh, the stuff you see on TV, about yeah. an hour and 40 minutes – away from where I'm going to live. Yeah. There is a small uh wrestling promotion in Arizona that uh-huh. has I think it's called a closed circuit television show okay. where it airs locally in Arizona. Oh, dude. That's like Monkey Wrench production right there. I like it grill stuff. Sweet. And I found out that the admission when they start a lot when if the world gets back to normal and they allow people in to the arena or the warehouse yeah uh it's free admission so oh man okay if uh i'll make sure to hit a few people up and try to make sure they can make their way out (laughs) sure man we'll stay in touch yep and okay going back to to woodchop Oh yeah, woodworking. <laughs> we we kind of went off a little bit, but uh, going back to woodworking. So, how did you get started in woodworking? I couldn't make it as a wrestler. What? I got into woodworking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. It was something I've always done. You know, like there was always a little project for me to do at home. Um, 
I might have been trying to like, I don't know, like hide from my brother, stay busy or whatever. And then I would just build stuff. So it was always my thing. And then uh, when I started to, I guess, need furniture, like I was speaking of college, going away to college. Yeah, I was a college kid. Yeah. So I was 20 and I had like a college apartment with college furniture. And I'm like, this is lame. And that's when I started making my own furniture when I was like 20. Yeah. Simple stuff. You know, like what you're doing now. Oh, man. Uh, leaps and bounds, you know, from what I was doing when I was even older than you. So, so it's cool what you're doing, man. I'm impressed. I appreciate it. How I got started in woodworking was, yeah. uh, well, this kind of doesn't count as woodworking, but mm -hmm. I was like maybe, uh, I'd say 11 years old. And it was one of those, yeah. you know, those uh, like build your own, like wooden Christmas trees, the, like the small, like maybe not even a foot tall, like situations. Yeah. That you can right. like spray paint and everything. Okay, like you're just like crisscrossing. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're just like crisscross cuts and you just got to put them together and it, it'd right. stand on its own. Yeah. I don't know if that counts as woodworking, but it that counts. was the first kind of technical woodworking project I had made. It counts as a good first one. And yeah. like I spray painted it green and like made it into a whole, I made like a little wooden Christmas tree. I don't know if I have pictures of it, but if yeah. I do, I'll make sure to like edit it in and like I love it. and make sure. So what was that like school or uh, or like Boy Scouts or something or what? That was just a little side project I did with my grandpa because oh, we were just God. bored one day in the garage and yes. we were like, he was like, you want to build a Christmas tree? And I was like, sure, why not? So that's good grandpa right there, man. He's so like, we did. And then, yeah. uh, I was in ninth grade and no, it was eighth grade and they were having me choose my classes. And uh, I was talking, I saw Woodshop or yeah, that's what it's called, Woodshop. So I saw Woodshop and I was like, oh, that seems cool, right? Yeah. Cause I, I mean, I know it's not like how you see in the movies and stuff, but from what I've seen, it's always kind of fascinated me, like, because I'm all, I'm a hands-on type person. Yeah. To where, yeah. like, if I can't, like, touch it and, like, work with it with my hands, then yeah. it's not going to end up working. I totally relate. Yeah, right. So I'm more of a hands-on guy than, like, a tell me how to do it, you know. You can tell me how to do it and then show me how to do it, and I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah, so, but that's when you're really learning is when you're doing it. Yeah, it's when, once yeah. you make that first cut on the bandsaw, you know how to do, you know how to do it to make sure you don't cut your finger off. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, you got to be super careful, super alert, super focused. Yeah, it keeps you on your toes for sure. There's no relaxing. You know, yeah, relaxing you can't. Comes later, right? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. The relaxing comes when, like, you're sanding or, like, you're yeah. coding or something. You can't yeah, be yeah. working on a huge uh, bandsaw being all tired from the night before. You know what I mean? Right. Totally. You can't. You got to yeah. be super like on your feet. Yeah. Not just like not tired, but you can't be like pissed off. You can't be sad. You got to like just be like legit. Zen. Yeah. You know, you got to go. You know, you got to be ready for anything. And. Yeah. Uh, so my first woodshop project was a fish that I I brought I found it but I also brought it back to the woodshop because uh -huh. I need to make a stand for it like I need to drill a hole in the back of it and put a stick in it and then make a stand that's funny I keep hearing about fishes in woodshop I'm like okay I guess it's a thing because that's our that was our first uh, since we were all in ninth grade we, uh -huh. we weren't we weren't allowed to do all the, you know, high for our first project, we were going to okay. do something easy. Yeah. So we said, you can either make a fish or a bird. Okay. And I was like, okay, I'll do a fish then. Mm -hmm. So I did it. Cool fish. 
Uh huh. What kind of wood did you use? I think I used oak. I use oak mm. for a lot of my project. I've I've noticed that. Okay. Okay. Um, did you see the fish? I don't know what it is. It's got like eight fish on it, made by the Maloof woodworker. I've I've seen it, but I can't tell you what the name of it is. Because uh, it's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't. Yeah. But this is why I'm like, wow, fish is a thing. Like even yeah. the leaf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was made out of walnut. And you can even see like the back fin in motion, right? And there's like mm -hmm. eight fish just like rushing, rushing by, right? They're all on sticks, right? On this like little, you know, thing you could put on your mantle or something. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have like a small school of fish just like zipping by and they're made out of walnut, you know, you know, Maloof loves walnut. Yeah, I, I've so, noticed that. <laughs> and so, cause I mean, you can, you can sand that real fine, you know, steel wool it and it has like fire grain, you know, sometimes that walnut is just crazy. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So let's talk about since we're already talking about the maloof foundation let's yeah. talk about that three-day trip oh man and so how it was proposed to me yeah was my wood shop teacher i know he's gonna listen to this because he told me he's gonna he's the one he's the one that helped he's the one that helped me with the notes <laughs> he's a good dude man he's a good dude I'm so impressed by him and I'm so happy for you that you get to have a teacher. I, I, I totally, you know, recognize him as a teacher. He's not just a woodshop teacher. He's a, he's a teacher, man, who cares a lot about his students and their overall learning experience and makes sure that you guys are actually writing. Because when you're writing, it elevates your learning so much, man. So bravo to you and your teacher. How I found out how I found out about yeah. uh, the Maloof uh, situation, the field trip, was I was working on my table, and then Castillo, uh, he walked up to me. He was like, I want you to go on this trip, right? Yeah. So we're going to yeah. work on the paperwork. I yeah. was like, okay. I yeah. At that point, I really kind of didn't know what he was talking about. It was, I mean, sure. I understood it but yeah. i like it wasn't really explained yet okay that didn't come until a few days later when he was like when we were all in class and then he explained it but at okay. first he was like yeah. you're gonna you're gonna go with me on this field trip and we're gonna make a table yeah. and we're gonna yeah. do it in three days which seems preposterous but we're doing it in three right. days right and we're gonna start on the paperwork and then we did i was like okay sure. cool Okay. And then I was in class the next day, and this was a when this was a Thursday. Uh -huh. So we were all in class, and he said he was like, "I need some kids to go on this uh, field trip to the Malou Foundation, and we're going to be making a end table in three days." And Did you show you a picture of it. Huh? Yeah, he, he did. You yeah. Yeah, he he showed he was like you're going to be making this table and it's insane okay. that we're going to be doing it in 3 days, but we're going to end up getting it done in 3 days. Wow. Okay. And he was like, "Okay, here's what you're going to do. We're going to go yeah. and we're going to start out by sanding, which is a little weird for us because we've never mm. started out a project by sanding." I think I remember you saying that when that was happening. Yeah, that and was I'm the like, first time we've ever yeah. started a project by sanding. <laughs> because we normally start by like cutting out, you know, the templates and everything. Yeah. And yeah. then we sand like near the end of it or whenever it's needed. Uh-huh. But, okay, so we, he was like, all right, you need <laughs> to be at the school by 640 by 650 so i got there at 640 right yeah i was like okay 
I'm here. And then he was like, okay, let's go. Let's get this stuff. We're going to go. So Mm -hmm. we got there. Uh And then, you know, I met you, Dennis, John, and Joan, and like all the rest Mm -hmm. of the guys. Mm -hmm. And then we did our introductions and everything. And Mm -hmm. we started, we ended up starting out by sanding the doubler. Which (laughs) of all the pieces, not just the doubler. No one sees the doubler, but yeah, that's what you started with. That's right. And then we, uh, later on, we ended up cutting out the center for like the middle piece. Like we cut off the sides to make it all curved. Yeah. yeah. And then right. we cut the legs and then we, once right. we start, once we cut the top, I was like, yeah, no, we were, it was before then we were choosing the, um, the three pieces of wood. Uh, yeah. And I particularly got lucky with uh, mm. the wood that was set on my table because uh-huh. the centerpiece just looked like one of the pieces that ended up being the centerpiece looked great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I love it when things like that happen. Yeah. yeah. And Dennis, I remember Dennis told us, oh. he was like, you're going to set this in place and you're going to just play around with it and like uh-huh. see which one like looks better to you. Yeah. I love so, that part. Yeah. I love that part. Yeah. Once I saw yeah. that piece, I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, this is going in the middle. Cause at mm-hmm. first, since I listened to a band named tool and love Tool, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they make great music. Yeah. <laughs> and once yeah. I saw that uh that middle piece so yeah. the tools artwork is done by a uh a artist by the name of alex gray okay and he makes like all these like psychedelic type designs for their artwork for yeah for like their album covers and stuff mm-hmm. so <clears throat> You seen how that middle piece? It looked like it was swirling out. Yeah. How it looked like it was like bursting out and everything. That yeah. made me. That immediately made me think of a Tool album cover. How Dude. it looks like it's spiraling out. Yeah. Nice. I was like, that's gonna be a sick middle piece. It's gonna be perfect for that top. Yeah. Especially with all the with the piece that was right next to it, how it just flowed. Yeah, they're all different. So I'm like, man, where is it? Show us right now your tabletop. Or is it not within reach? Uh, It is now in, it's still at uh, San Jacinto's Woodshop. Oh, yeah? I think I have a picture of it, though. Let me. Okay. Hey, don't let them sell it. It's yours. I'm going to, I'm going to keep it. I'm, I'm taking that with me. <laughs> the nice piece, man. Yeah. Photos and videos. So, at what point did you believe you were going to finish it in three days? Uh, once we got to the middle of that second day. Oh, I you were still in disbelief until then. Huh? You were like still not believing you were going to finish this? Yeah, I didn't think or that like I was going to get that done. Uh, yeah, wow. I didn't. I didn't think I was. Okay. Normally, I don't know why, but it always happens when I do a witch out project. So, okay. For some reason, something goes wrong. Like I either cut something the wrong way, and something doesn't fit, to where oh. I have to like you know take extra time out and try to fix it. That's I don't right. know why, but it always happens. Um, count on it, man. Yeah, it's always going to keep happening too. That's woodworking. But I found out that I have a video of the uh, tabletop. Yep. Here it is. I don't okay. Know if you really see yeah, that. I see. Um, I see the center of that centerpiece. That's right. It's wicked. I, I mean, I know it kind of. A little too bright. The video over video is yeah. yeah. Well, I believe you, man. I believe you. I'm happy that you're happy with that. That center part, especially, yeah. 
I'm really with, I'm really happy. Did it change with that, your you know? mood when? Yeah, like mm-hmm. did it change your mood when? Oh, did you, you... the audio cut out for a second, but I can, oh. I can still hear you. I was I was wondering if like it changed your mood when you knew you were going to be able to finish it. It, yeah, it did tremendously. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I'm actually going to be able to finish this. The, this uh-huh. is awesome. <laughs> oh, man. That's good to know. That's good to know. I mean, as, as far as like a facilitator, you know, in the, in the shop, um, I know there's a lot for me to get to know. So I, I totally appreciate being able to, you know, hear your experience. So, so what else? What else happened that you remember uh, taking away? <laughs> I remember uh, when Joan, when like we first got introduced to Joan, and then he told us he did that presentation mm-hmm. of uh, all his stop stop motion mm-hmm. animation and yeah. all that stuff that I thought was really cool in his drawings. And I, oh. after that, I went up and asked him about. Oh. Um, the uh about if he ever drew something that someone got tattooed oh yeah and he said that he never has but it got really close once okay and i'm looking since i already wrote down some questions for joan i'm trying i'm gonna try to see if i can to see Uh if like scheduling works out so Uh i can get him on this show and then we can you know talk about the three-day trip and everything and this is the first time on this podcast that i've actually talked about me being a woodshop student and Uh like just woodworking in general yeah interesting do you have tattoos uh no but i have several plants for tattoos (laughs) (laughs) i was wondering why you brought that up yeah because right. my dad is a former tattoo artist. Oh wow! Like I grew up watching him tattoo people in the garage, and yeah. like I read his tattoo magazines. Uh-huh. And I I have a few of them here, but I'm, uh-huh. I'll I'll pull that out later. But okay. uh, like when I needed something to read, he was like, mm-hmm. "Here, read this." So I. I just I'd take his tattoo magazines and then yeah. I just like look through the pages and see how cool all the tattoos were and how yeah. different each one of them was and how like the artwork made each one of them like pop out. Yeah. You can tell a good tattoo from a bad tattoo. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. And it depend you can I can also tell well, if you look at a tattoo, you can also tell if the artist was very light-handed or if the artist was very heavy-handed. Yeah. Because how you can tell that is if the tattoo lines are like very light and Mm -hmm. they're light, but you can still see them Uh and they look good. Uh That's how you can tell you're dealing with a light-handed artist. Mm. But if it's, if it's a very heavy-handed artist, the lines are a lot thicker and a lot darker. Wow. Uh, while you're describing that, I'm kind of relating that. And it that hurts a lot to, more. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I'm kind of relating that to woodworking. Do, do you see that too? Like the light-handed and the heavy-handed woodworker? Yeah. Since I've been around like tattoo machines and seeing people do that, yeah. also seeing people work on like, if they're like turning something on the bandsaw, I can see if they're uh-huh. like being real light with it and being real, uh, being light and careful with it or being real yeah. rough and like, you know, right. turning into it and trying to make sure that it, cause if they turn it real hard and they're like holding Forcing. it real tight, yeah, just gonna like, you know, shoot yeah. across the shop. Uh, uh huh. It might hit you too. Yeah. Cause <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me uh, one time <laughs> <laughs> one time uh, so I was working on my fish like I was uh, working on the tail 
and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was on the spindle sander. I was uh, turning it, right? Uh-huh. And apparently, like, it, it got away from me and shot across the shop. <laughs> <laughs> from a spindle sander, I'm, I'm surprised. Because it, it wasn't the router. Yeah, surprisingly, it wasn't the router. Uh, huh. But what what also happened was I was working on that, and when it shot across the shop, yeah. my hand turned into it, and I ended up punching the spindle sander. Ouch. And yeah, yeah that hurt. <laughs> oh yeah. And then the the yeah. fish shot across the shop. <laughs> and Blind like, fish, and the whole the whole class just came to a stop and looked at me, and I was like, I didn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I turned off the machine, ran and got my project, and went back. In. Wow, man, um, shop safety. That's yeah. That's, that's something. That's something. Do they have like zones where you, where people need to? be careful when they walk because flying fish might like slap them in the face yeah they got safety zones okay good i mean there there hasn't been a flying fish since my freshman year but okay uh yeah Yeah, you can tell that's a total freshman move too (laughs) yeah have you had have you had a piece like maybe on a router table Right, like, come back and hit you in the gut. No, but I've heard horror stories about that. Yeah, it's happened a couple of times. There was another time where, you know, from the router table, it didn't hit me in the gut, but it flew across the garage and, just, and it pierced the hole in the wall. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's so, the- danger zone, man. Yeah. And uh, so since we were talking about the router, uh, the only yeah. thing I've ever had happen on the router is I've had tear out happen on the router when I was. All the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but yeah. like this tear out was so bad. It like uh-huh. tore a line through it and like burnt the entire like piece of wood. Wow. It was just yeah it was and yeah. it didn't shoot across the shop or anything but it was just yeah. so i had to yeah yeah and what's the most dangerous tool or machine in the shop that i have experienced or or that i've dealt with or just in general uh in general uh i'd have to I'd have to say um, either the uh, the radio radio arm saw, the band saw, or a, yeah, the, that's the radio arm saw where you do the cross cuts, right? Yeah, right. You're pulling it. Maybe you're chopping it down, but. It's got yeah. an arm that travels like a whole foot or so. Because yeah, right? uh, I've used the, both the chopping down and the radio, and the one where you pull it forward. Yeah. Those, that and the bandsaw have to be yeah. like the two most dangerous things in the shop. Because yeah. you never know. <laughs> Something goes wrong and might lose a finger. I know. I know. You know, that's how Sam lost his... his tip of his finger the bandsaw he did yeah um you know that question was the question that dennis asked me did he ask you that like what's the the, what's the most dangerous tool or machine in the shop uh no he did not he didn't ask he didn't ask us that i really think it's a good question um i think i remember the answer but i could be wrong but i think like his question really like led me into really consider that, mm. but like um, immediately my I think my answer was the bandsaw. You know, because it seems like you're handling it, and then all of a sudden like the blade is there. You're like, oh yeah. damn! I almost didn't see that. 
and you're so close to your hands are so close to the blade. So right. you never right. know. You, right. you might not be watching your thumb one day and you'd be half a thumb, you know? Totally. So I think his answer was whatever machine you're using at the moment. Oh, that's, that's a good answer. I think so too. That, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Cause even the spindle sander, I mean, who would think uh, that's dangerous, but I've almost hurt myself on the spindle sander too. I've hurt myself on the spindle sandal, spindle, spindle sander. <laughs> so I know. Yeah. I, I know. <laughs> yeah. But Luckily it, looks, it was only a so, knuckle, but. Yeah. Right. But it looks so friendly. Yeah. I know. Right. <laughs> right. There's no blade. It's round, you know, cushiony. Got, got the sandpaper. Like nothing could go wrong. Right. But you never know. You might end up socking a spindle sander one day. Whatever tool you're using at the time. Yeah. So as we continue, I met you at the Move Foundation, how we, we talked about how we got started in woodworking. And we talked about, the, let's talk about how that three-day trip went down. All right. So we got there. And you introduced yourself, and then uh, I can't remember exactly what we talked about as we were walking mm -hmm. to the shop. Yeah. But once we got to the shop, we got introduced to Dennis, and then we started out sanding on the doubler. Yeah. It's and then weird. we had... Critical the doubler. Yeah. <laughs> That's had a the critical piece, isn't it? It really is to keep it all together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we um Yeah. I mean the double is what lets you finish it in three days, in three short days. You know, yeah. like at the end you're like drilling the doubler into the legs and then drilling the doubler into the tabletop and like boom, you're done. So critical piece right there. Anyway, sorry to Yeah, it it's all right. You're my guest, so you can and go right ahead. <laughs> And then we uh, we went to we got the legs and we didn't start. I don't think no. We started cutting the legs the first day. I think we might have started cutting legs the oh, first yeah. day. Yeah, because I remember we started like we didn't start drawing out the top until maybe the la maybe this middle or ending of the second day. When like we drew out the top and then we finally cut it out, yeah. And I remember mine was a little bit off by like an eighth of an inch. Mm -hmm. you oh no, no, that was that wasn't because of it. It's because we were, uh, me and John were routing. Yeah, and actually, that's happened twice, where I was, um, I was working on the center, and mm -hmm. I. I used the radial arm saw to cut it down. Yeah. And it got caught and like flew back, but it got, it was in the machine. So it wasn't anything. Uh -huh. And Dennis was there. He watched the whole thing. Okay. And he was like, that's one of the first times I've ever seen that happen. Like, mm -hmm. at least it didn't fly back. Yeah. So the second time that happened was uh, me and John were doing the radial arm saw for the bottom of the top. Okay. And, uh, like, uh, John was taught, like, he was showing me how to do it and talking me through it and being like, okay, here's what you want to do. He was showing me how to do it. So he was doing it. And oh. then he let his hand off for a, for a second. And then it just, mm. it just. Whoosh. Oh, was that your tabletop? Yes. Oh, dang. Because. Because it really shocked John, you know? He was yeah, like, he, I couldn't believe it happened. I, he was I really... I my like, yeah. hand off just for the whole quick second. Yeah. It didn't hit anybody, though, huh? No, it just, it just hit the back of the wall, and it just fell down. Then we had to get it. Man, that's a big piece to fly, right? Yeah. That's a big piece. You know, I mean, you had, 
what is it, a 24 inch diameter? Yeah, so? it was like a 24 inch tabletop, yeah. Yeah. 24, maybe 25 inches. And then what we had to do was we had to cut an eighth of an, because of what happened, we had to cut an eighth of an inch off oh. of the entire thing. Oh. And I was thinking, oh, this is going to make it so much smaller. But then, uh-huh. no, uh-huh. It, it, it was hardly any effect. Oh, really? Did you, like, take it back to the bandsaw to cut or what? Yeah, that's what we did. Oh, interesting. And then we okay. recut it on the, yeah. on, the, uh, on the router. Okay. And I spent a lot of time. <laughs> Once Joam saw what happened, he was like, whoa. He was like, how'd you do that? And then uh-huh. I was like, I didn't do it. John did it. And John was <laughs> like, yeah, I did it. And then he was like, whoa. <laughs> Yeah, when I heard about it, I was like, whoa, too. <laughs> and uh, we, he helped me cut it. And then I had to spend a lot of time sanding over that spot. Mm. That was like the real rough spot that I had to work really hard on. And now mm-hmm. uh, I can't even notice it. Like if I'm looking for it, I can't notice yeah. it. Good job, man. Is that like the edge or what? It was like, yeah, it was the middle yeah. of, not the middle of the bottom, but it was the edges of it. Yeah. It was on like the very right side. Uh-huh. And if I had it, I could show it to you, but unfortunately <laughs> I do not have it. But uh-huh. yeah, uh, when, when uh, I try to look for it, I can't. Yeah. I can't feel it. And I had the table upside down because I was working on the legs because they ended up getting real ashy. So I had to like, you know, kind of touch it up a little bit. And I was looking at the bottom of the top and I couldn't find that spot. You did? Like at all. (laughs) Good work. Good work. That's woodworking, man. You got it. You know what you're doing. So, uh, next question is, uh, well, actually, I understand that you have some questions for me, right? I might. I mean, if, you know, I had short answers or something, I can at least come back with questions. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Because, I mean, that's it. I only know you from those three days. Yeah, that's true. We, We haven't, like, we haven't done anything outside of that yeah and so i thought um and thanks for the invitation onto your show because that gives me a chance to get to know you more as like instead of just as a woodworker as like a person right so when i heard you had a podcast i'm like yeah that guy seemed you know more interesting than the average like woodshop cat right so and to hear that you're going to you know arizona for for film school and stuff. That's real cool. And I think if I had some questions, you've answered a, a few along the way, you know? So let me, okay. let me let me take a look. I wrote some over there. Let me see. Uh, let me see. Um, I think we've gone through all the questions on the notes that I have. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you're in woodshop at school, how many students are there? There's like maybe 24 students in the shop. Oh my goodness, are you serious? Like in the, no, like in the class? Yeah. Uh, since we have the classes online because of the circumstances. Oh, sure. sure. So sure. like there's supposed to be 24 kids in the class, but... Not everyone okay. shows up. So normally it's like the huh? It's if, like this. If it wasn't COVID, you know, if we weren't in COVID, were there would there be like two dozen students in class? About that, yeah. Wow. Okay. Um 
what would you say is like the common denominator? I mean, just in the experience we had, you know, getting to know you and uh, Alejandro and Evan, you know, and all the other woodworkers in there, Joe, John, Dennis, uh, Castillo, like we're all different, right? Mm -hmm. Except for Woodshop, I don't know if we would hang out at all. Maybe, you know, catch a wrestling event or something. Mm -hmm. And but uh, what Evan, would you say? Oh, yeah. I'll continue. I didn't mean to cut you off. Continue. No, no problem. No problem. But what would you say is like our common denominator? Like the or, thing or that ties us all wood together? Wood. Yeah. Besides Woodshop? Wood wood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or is woodworking the yeah, is woodworking the thing that ties us together? I think woodworking might be the thing. I mean, with Joan, it might be like visual visual effects and like how he does the stop motion stuff in the drawing. And since I'm going to school to learn how to do special effects makeup, like the movie monsters and stuff, they could like blow their heads off and stuff like that. Trying to make Frankenstein and stuff like that. So I yeah. think that's one thing that me and him might like click on. But I think the rest of the rest of us, well, Ev Evan, well, Evan, I've had him on the show mm -hmm. before. He was the, he was, believe it or not, he was the first uh, video podcast that I had done. Yeah, because I could have had a video before, but I kind of didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, because you know it was early early days of the podcast but yeah. still uh i've known evan since sixth grade maybe mm -hmm. and like we met each other in i think my avid class for like college or something yeah yeah and then like we talked about basketball and yeah. I mean, I don't really watch basketball that much anymore uh -huh. because, you know, games are never on. But uh, I still get, like, highlights and stuff, and we both have the same favorite team and same favorite basketball player. We, all, we both have that one player that uh, yeah. we're going to follow him where whatever team he goes to, we're yeah. not necessarily a fan of that team, but we're a fan of that player. So, like, like we'll support him wherever he goes. Who's that? Uh, Blake Griffin. Blake Griffin. I actually have his jersey uh, over here. Blake uh, Clippers. Is he still with the Clippers? Uh, no, he's with the Brooklyn Nets this year. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Yeah, um, appreciate that, dude. Okay, is uh, would you say um, uh, Evan is um, a hands-on dude too? Yeah. yeah. Heavily, yeah. Yeah, I think that might be a common denominator. All oh, right. yeah, that, that might be for all of us that were like real hands on. Right, right. I think that's what got us in the wood shop in the first place. Yeah, that I'm, I'm thinking right. that might be it too. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. So I, I was thinking of um, some other questions, you know. Can I, can I try one on you? Yeah, go ahead. You're my guest, so. Fire away. Um, okay. They might be like, like... Holy crap, we've already been going for 50 minutes. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. here's a question. Here's a question. Because you're a senior in high school. I mean, you're about to graduate. You're about, your life is about to commence, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's easy to, for me to think back at that time, you know? And how fast like time goes by, right? Mm. Like, have you ever, have you ever heard like, how, right now what you're seventeen or eighteen? Eighteen, yeah. Okay, like you're gonna feel like eighteen, part of you, for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. like, even when you're thirty, forty, fifty, like you're still gonna like feel part like of that. You kid. is still gonna feel like an eighteen year old. I don't know if your dad, your grandpa ever says that. Uh, I've never actually heard that. I've heard that somewhat, but
but I've never heard it yeah. phrased that way before. All right. All right. That's a little con context right there. Um, okay. So here's the question for you. General question. Do you think like over the course of time, like lifetime, that mm -hmm. people change? Do you think people change versus, versus, oh. versus they are who they are and they don't change? You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, if so, you're talking like that, it depends. It honestly, yeah. like 100% depends on the person. Okay. Like say if, like for me, if I'm going to use myself as an example, for me, okay. uh, say I've wanted to be a professional wrestler my entire life. Yeah. I kind of grew up watching wrestling around my mom when she was alive and my brothers and everything that I'll yeah. get into after we get, after we get done, because it, that'll go down a path. I don't want to go down on the okay. show yet, but okay. Okay. cool. anyway, uh, my mom, my mom, my grandma, everybody, huge wrestling fans. I'm wearing yes. a macho man shirt right now. Macho man, Randy Savage. Dude, yeah, I'm wearing a Macho Man shirt up, right now. Oh, now that I see, I grew up watching wrestling, so I totally appreciate your uh, your aficionado, your your fanaticism for it. Because you know, me and my cousins, we would go to these shows, dude, and fucking excuse me, we would. Hey, hey you can you can curse, you can do it. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> um, Pokemania was running wild back then. So you know, this top. was like maybe 87 yeah. or, or cause it was from 85 to about 89. Yeah. And then exactly. he left and then went to exactly. WCW in 1990. No, it was WWF. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Andre, the giant, the iron Sheik, Sergeant Slaughter, Tito Santana, Jimmy, Jimmy Superfly Snuka. Snuka. Yep. Ricky yeah. Steamboat. Ricky Steamboat, yeah. WrestleMania three, Macho Man Randy Savage, Ricky Steamboat for the Intercontinental Title, one of the best matches in the history of the business. I might have seen it live. Really? I mean, not like not in person, but like on. But TV. like on pay per view. The reason why my mom canceled cable when we were kids is because my brother was always putting me in wrestling moves. <laughs> I feel. <laughs> uh, speaking of that. I feel like yeah. every re like that that's one phase every wrestling fan goes through. Okay. Like, like they go they go through the phase where they think it's 100% real where they don't know if I'm if I'm going to use wrestling terminology, it's a work. Yeah. You know. Okay, got you. Yeah. No, we so, thought it was real, man. Yeah. Like every wrestling fan goes through that phase where they think it's real and they like wrestle with each other in the backyard. Like they put yep. each other in headlocks and like, yep. and like the camel clutch and you know stuff like that. Then yep. they they ended they end up the having to go like chiropractor. Dude, like, that was. Oh. Yeah, exactly. That was me in first grade. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> uh, you had older brothers. Yeah, I have three older brothers. Okay, that explains. Yeah, of course they're gonna try all kinds of stuff on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, do people change? Uh, well, it depends on the person. Okay. Because, say, like for me, the whole wrestling thing, I, I wanted to be a wrestler since I was five years old. Uh, yeah. I, see, I'm 18 now. I'm still going to do it. Yeah. So, in yeah. that aspect, I haven't changed. Okay. But in certain other aspects like say i used to never watch horror movies until like say about 2019 where i got like huge into it uh -huh. and that aspect i had changed because uh -huh. i remember it was a few years before i started like going deep dive into it yeah yeah i remember specifically telling my grandpa i will never like i will never like horror movies i'm Never gonna like him. I'll never watch him. But mm. now, yeah, I got a scream mask staring at me, so <laughs> that that kind of 
<laughs> tells you how I've changed in that kind of, you know, perspective. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. So to answer so, that question, it uh, all depends on the person. Yeah. And the situations. All right. So like um, fast forward 10, 20, 30 years from now, right? Like mm-hmm. what do you not want to have changed about yourself? Uh, what do you want to keep? My wrestling fandom, which I'm, mm-hmm. I'm probably still going to keep by that because by that time I will hopefully be – a wrestler, so that's probably never going to go away. Uh-huh. Uh, my love of movies and just film in general, and my love uh-huh. of like heavy metal music. I hope that never goes away. Yeah, yeah. Everything else can change. I'm good. Yeah. All as as long as I keep those three fundamental things, I'm I'm good. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Hey, just because I know, like, we might be running out of time, if you had a time limit on it, I want to ask you another one. You can go as long as you want. Okay, so um, a common denominator, another common denominator that I think I just picked up on. If you don't mind me asking, right? Go right ahead. Um, But maybe, okay, so uh, you mentioned that your mom has passed away. Mm-hmm. She passed away when I was seven years old. Yeah. Wow. Breast cancer. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. Sorry to hear that, man. In 10 years. It's all good. Oh, man. That's terrible. But, um, yeah, I know it sucks. <laughs> hey, my dad died when I was nine years old. Oh, that's, that's you another see what thing. I mean? Yeah. Like, I just picked up on, on something, and, and no one knows what it's like, right? Unless you've been there before. Right. Right. Because, like, you never, you know, you don't want death to, in a lack of a better word, death to connect people. Like, in a certain way, to connect people. But it does. It defines. Yeah, it defines certain situations. Yeah. Think about it. We're all going to die. We, none of us are immortal. No matter how much Hulk Hogan says he's immortal, he's going <laughs> to die soon. Right. Like, it's, death is inevitable. It's one thing we can't... We, it's one thing that we cannot, uh, like, try to avoid. Because right. you never... Because right. the Green Reaper is going to knock on your door one of these days. We don't know yeah. when it's going to be. Hopefully not soon, but it's yeah. gonna inevitably happen. Yeah, no, it helps us like kind of value Open, life, yeah. contemplate about it. What's the meaning of it? You know, mm-hmm. um, it was hard to talk. Just it was hard to talk. I don't think I talked for like a year after my my dad died. It was, um, yeah, after my mom died. I <laughs> since I was so young, I didn't know how to process it. Yeah. So from what I was told, I processed it by acting out, like mm. severely acting out. And because mm. I, I, as far as I knew, my mom was gone and I did not know why. Yeah. So I was acting out severely where I was, you know, grounded for months at a time, but oh, wow. I didn't know how to, that was my way of processing it because I didn't know what was going on oh man understandable yeah yeah and i was living I remember, with like, her mom at the time oh i'm sorry to interrupt you but no not at all no, no i was living with her mom at the time and i talked to her recently yeah and she was like oh, that's how you did it and like we we punished you but we knew what was going on because of uh because you didn't know how to handle it. We we thought it was okay that you acted out. I mean, it was not okay, but it was okay because that was your way of trying to make sense of it all. Yeah. Anyway, uh, continue. Yeah. 
I didn't mean to cut you off. I don't be. I don't want to be one of those podcast hosts. No, I appreciate what you have to say about it. Anytime you want to talk about it, man. Uh, let that be like common denominator number one, right there. Mm-hmm. You know, I think for me, woodchuck has allowed me to process some thoughts. You know, like getting into sanding. How you say, like, okay, once you're in, once you're in that sanding phase you can really like start sorting things out. Like in your Cause mind. you have a lot of time About, to just think. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause it's such so, like a, you don't really need to think about it type of motion where you don't right. need to be so alert to say when you're on the right. bandsaw, you don't need to be like, Oh, I'm gonna cut my hand off. You're like, no, I'm not going to sand my fingers down. That's not going to happen. You can, you know what right. I mean? It's just sandpaper. Yeah. But I know too that because of, you know, your experience growing up, you know, you have, um, I don't want to say a higher value for life, but you've at least like considered life and death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of people don't, you know, at an early age, not until later in life, but not until they get like in their (laughs) thirties. Right. It's almost as if you've not even, like lived without that consideration of where it's always lingering in the back of my head. Right. Oh, right. Uh, lost you for a second. Yeah. That's, how it, was, for a that's how it has been for me, man. Yeah. That, that's been for me. And that's why I do without bringing that up. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, yeah, I think it's important. And a huge way uh, for me to cope was uh, because me and her used to always watch wrestling together. Oh, really? Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. One of her favorite, it was 2009. Yeah. Uh So that's why the year 2009, for some reason, has always been one of my favorite years in just like professional wrestling history yeah because that was that was the year before uh everything happened wrestlemania best of i don't see what it says at the bottom from one to one to one to xiv which was 14 from one to 14 yeah that's awesome and like she'd tape it and then we'd watch we'd watch uh raw and we'd watch the wrestling from that week and i remember specifically one time yeah, yeah. uh her favorite re- one of her favorite wrestlers was uh was a man by the name uh-huh. of jeff hardy jeff hardy and uh-huh. he he's st- he's part of like a legendary tag team with his brother matt uh-huh. And uh, he still wrestles to this day. Well, I think he's Jeff's out on an injury with his rotator cuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was 2009. He was in a steel cage match where mm-hmm. if he lost, he'd have to leave the company. The okay. plans were that he was going to leave the company already because oh. his contract was coming up. Okay. Yeah. And he didn't want to resign. Mm-hmm. So he lost the match. And I remember once he lost the match, mm-hmm. my mom was in shock. Oh. Yeah. She was like, oh. Uh-huh. Yeah. And yeah. then he gave that farewell speech. Uh-huh. Where he said, this, is, this isn't goodbye for now. Or this isn't goodbye forever. This is goodbye for now. Okay. And then that stood true for maybe... 12 or like maybe six or seven years it yeah. it stood true until 2017 when he finally came back uh, but you know here or there but yeah. uh yeah. yeah there's that yeah and any other questions oh uh, who's your favorite podcaster that is a hard – I can give you, like, a top 10. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I know favorite, favorites are, like, stupid questions sometimes. So, of course, you can't sum it up in one. But give me like, some. I, like, I'm a huge uh, 
I also grew up watching a lot of MMA. So I'm a huge MMA fan also. Okay. So in turn, I'm a huge, and I'm a huge like comedy fan of oh, like people so like Dave coming. Chappelle and Joe yeah. Rogan so and Rogan. Joey Diaz yes. and people like that. Joey Diaz is so funny. Yeah. Joey Diaz is, he's my man, dude. He's, yeah. he's one of the funniest men on the planet. Same with Tom Segura, one of the funniest people I have ever seen. Yeah. So, yeah. If I had to give you a top 10, it'd be Stone Cold Steve Austin, since he has a, he has a show. Edge uh-huh. and Christian, since they had a show. Chris uh-huh. Jericho, who I really hope I'm going to wrestle. Because he's 50. Because <laughs> think about it. He's 50 years old, but he's doing some of the best work of his career right now. Really? Yeah. Okay. The man always knows how to reinvent himself. It's insane. Interesting. He's been okay. in the business for thirty years, and he he can still reinvent himself like that. What's his name? Chris Jericho. It sounds. I'll, cool. I'll send you a couple of like highlight reels or something. I'll, okay. I'll I got you on that front. I got you. Okay. Cool. Okay. Cool. And yeah. I consider myself a fountain of useless knowledge when it comes to wrestling metal music because i grew up listening to bands like slayer and metallica and iron maiden and i went to slayer's final show actually no way yeah whoa it was was insane it It was in it was in the form it was at the forum in inglewood california yeah Yeah. Yeah. but uh okay so back to the question jericho Okay. Chris Van Vliet, who is a I think he yeah, he's a he he's a wrestling and film interviewer. He's a multi time Emmy winner mm-hmm. for like podcasting and stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna have to pull up my Google Podcasts. Um uh Eric Bischoff, Jim Cornette, uh Joe Rogan is a is a top one. And then Tom Segura has his own podcast. He's number two. And same with Joey Diaz is number three. But I think that has to be like my top. Dang. Sounds like you know your podcast uh, industry pretty well. It, it's a so, mixture of wrestling and comedy. Yeah. Right there. That's a pretty good school for you already. You know? So yeah. you, you're taking that with you into a more academic setting now. Um but it seems like, man, I'm really impressed how you pursue your interests. Wrestling, podcasts, you know, horror show and all that. Woodworking. So last question, I guess. Uh, do you think you'll continue woodworking? Uh, whenever I get the chance, yeah. If something, if something pops up that interests me and they're making something cool, I'll like totally go ahead and be like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. How long is it? If it's like three days, hell yeah. I've made a table in three days. I can do it again. Uh-huh. Would you set up your own workshop at home? Do you think that's part of your uh, future, your mix? Uh, if I have, since I'm going to be very busy in the future, because mm-hmm. I'm going to dive headfirst into wrestling, and they're on the mm-hmm. road 300 days a year. Oh, yeah. So the schedule is pretty tough. Oh wow! Yeah. And what they do yeah. is when they go home, they like, they don't even like, they get maybe three days off, right? Mm-hmm. So what they do is they wash their clothes, yeah. put it back in the suitcase, put that suitcase in the car, and they just relax for two days, because their mindset is they're always on the road, always on the road. So. Yeah. If There's I probably had some to, recovery then yeah. yeah, that's if they get injured or something like that, yeah. Yeah. But back to the question, if I had the time, yeah. since time's gonna be a huge factor, if I had yeah. the time, I'd totally yeah. do it. And if I had like the financial resources, I'd totally do it. Yeah. That's a tough one, huh? It's like an expensive uh hobby if if hobby is what it is yeah um 
Okay, so let me uh, let me let me put all my best wishes, you know, um, toward your wrestling career. I won't be so concerned about your woodworking career, right? <laughs> so I want to make sure um, uh, I'm, uh, you know, sending sending best best wishes in the right direction. But dude, love to hear how passionate you are, you know about wrestling, uh, about connecting with people. And along the way, reach out, please. All right. Well, I guess this is where we're going to end the show. Uh, so uh, plug your stuff and also like plug any social medias you have and also yeah. plug the Maloof, the Maloof Foundation if you want. I'm yeah, pretty sure I'll have you on for a second episode so we can dive into everything like outside of woodworking like yeah. movies and music and wrestling and all that stuff yeah that'll, that'll be on a future episode if you have the time and if you want to oh it sounds great sounds great well actually good point the maloof because that's that's where we met um yeah if it wasn't for you the know maloof, sam we wouldn't, have having, maloof. Right. We wouldn't be having this conversation right now <laughs> right like when i first heard about Sam Aloof, I was already, you know, woodworking. Mm. Uh, I was trying to figure out, like, how am I going to make a living doing this? Because it's very difficult, it seems. And then someone told me about what Sam. What I heard is very difficult, yeah. Trying to sell a $2,000 chair, you know what I mean? Right. It's difficult to sell expensive furniture. <laughs> right? That's why today I was making a deck and not furniture. So I have to like balance things out that way. But um, what, um, what pleases me so much is that the Malou Foundation could attract and inspire you, you know, at 18 years old, you know. So oftentimes when I'm there, a lot of people who come through are, you know, older than me, retired, they're putting their retirement funds and time into their workshop. And sometimes I get a little concerned that, you know, the young people aren't getting into it. Mm -hmm. And like, maybe it's just going to be a lost, uh, a lost art. Um, but to see that, that three days really meant a lot to me, you know, uh, it was it only the second too. Cool. It was only the second time it happened and we got to like, you know, give, uh, we gotta acknowledge Roy Castillo for yeah. going through what he Good had man. to go through to make it happen. Right? He he basically brought you guys to us. We didn't do much to to make it happen. It was just you know him pushing through and and then Dennis applying his workshop into the time that you you guys could actually you know come to the Maloof. So, uh, Mr. Castillo uh, um, made it really easy for all of us to have this mm -hmm. wonderful experience you know um so that's my plug for the maloof um the maloofoundation.org i think you'll find maloof foundation on the, on the ig as well at um, maloof foundation i'm a sure I'm, yeah. I'm sure it's at maloof foundation yeah 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 and they hired me just like a year ago three weeks into my hire the pandemic, you know, broke loose. Pandemonium yeah. was running wild. And uh, it felt like like it was too good to be true. Like I knew it. Mm -hmm. a, a job Something at the moment. Would happen. It, was just, it was just too good to be true. But what happened was I kept on working there like two days a week mm -hmm. for uh, the length of time that we've been shut down. And that gave me a chance to build up the, the barns, you know. Mm -hmm. Whatever, you know, cabinetry, shelving, um, anything, right? We mm -hmm. had some good tools. We just needed to, you know, make sure they were organized, right? So um, that's what I do, man. I'm there one or two days a week, um, hopefully more in the future. And then at the same time, I have my own brand, Luz de Mano. You can find me on Instagram as well. And... You know, I like to make custom furniture. Sometimes my own inspiration. Sometimes I get commissioned. 
Um, I do a line of uh, home decor products as well, like frames for records, frames for art, frames for photos. So those I make in small batches in between commissions. That's my way of like filling in time. Um, but keep in touch. You can, you can find me there. Loose to model. Instagram. On Instagram, right? Yeah. 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 All right, cool. So ladies and gentlemen, this has been George from the Blue Foundation. He's slowly but surely becoming a good friend of mine. <laughs> so uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode and hopefully we'll have him on in the future. So uh, me on. no problem. Just let me know if you ever want to come back. <laughs> oh, you got me, man. You got me. So, all right, good luck. Call us for anything, anytime, all right? All right. See you guys later.